to the book of Matthew. Turn left, go two books, and there it is, Zechariah. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the amazing revelation that's contained in this book. And I pray that, Lord, tonight we would open our heart, we would be teachable, because we would understand how this applies to our lives. And so we look now to your word and by your Holy Spirit to be transformed. In Jesus' name, amen. Zechariah is a, a prophet and a priest, and he uh, is ministering about the same time as Haggai, exactly the same time as Haggai, contemporary to Ezra and Nehemiah. The, the time frame is Israel has been held captive in Babylon for 70 years. As prophesied in the scriptures, 70 years, there's a lot to say about that. But at the end of that 70 years, Babylon itself was uh, defeated uh, by the, the Persian Medo Empire. And that was another amazing story. Cyrus comes into power. Cyrus, a Persian, allows anyone who wants to go back to go back, uh, to rebuild the city of Jerusalem, to rebuild the temple of God, and to send the articles, etc., for the rebuilding of the temple. So about 50,000, so about 50,000 make the trek, the journey, from Babylon to Jerusalem. Now, when they get there, they discover what a huge challenge this is now going to be, because this is devastation. They come to a pile of rubble. I mean, it is just rocks and uh, uh, boulders and, and blocks, of, just a pile of rubble. That's all, all it is. <clears throat> and so they've got this huge mammoth task. Now, stepping back for a moment, what about the rest of them? Because we might say, why only 50,000? Seemed like there would have been a whole lot more Jews than that. That's true. You're right. There were a whole lot more Jews than that. But many of them decided not to go back. Well, why not? I mean, that was their country. That was the land that God gave them. That was the city of his possession. Why wouldn't they go back? Well, because they had found a pretty good life in Babylon. They became... Some of them pretty successful and started up businesses and farms and, and uh, uh, they got involved with commerce and they got involved with stuff and their lives became all intertangled with the commerce and all the stuff going on in the city and they had some pretty nice houses. Babylon was a very luxuriant city, one of the richest in the world and uh, oh, the hanging gardens of Babylon, you know, just beautiful. Uh, you know, you're just living in, you know, it's like the upper end of the upper end, you know. And it's gorgeous, the, the beautiful gardens and the, the flowing creeks that would go through, through the tributaries. And, oh, it was just beautiful. And they had all kinds of great stuff to eat. And, I mean, you can get anything you wanted at the market. And there were fruits and vegetables and all kinds of different meats available and fish. And you can put on a banquet feast for your family and all kinds of fruit ices and delicacies and desserts and all kinds of things. Isn't that a great picture? So why in the world would you want to go back to that pile of rubble? Well, because God said to. That's why. You know, it's interesting because there was a time when Jerusalem was about to be destroyed that he said to Jerusalem, give it up, give it up. This city is going to be destroyed. The safest place for you is to give it up. Get out of Jerusalem, willingly go to Babylon, because there you will be protected there. Pray for the welfare of the city, he said. To Bab about Babylon. Pray for the welfare of that city. Because its welfare is your welfare. So some of them took that to heart. There was a time, get out of Jerusalem. Go to Babylon. Pray for the welfare of the city. They did that. And they got there and they got involved with commerce and great houses and uh, nice clothes. And it was all good. 
And then God said, now is the time to go back to Jerusalem. Now leave all that. Leave all of the Babylonian commerce and all of those delicacies. Now the safest place is for you to go to Jerusalem. Because there's, my blessing is going to be on that now. Time to move. Get out of that now. Move back. That's, they didn't want to do that. Well, 50,000 did. 50,000. A remnant. That's not many, but 50,000. They get there. They see this huge pile of rubble. But they've been commissioned. Cyrus says, you can rebuild it. So they start to rebuild the foundation. They find the, 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 the stones and they laid the foundation stones all in place. There's a lot to say about that. But they laid the foundation stones. And uh, the people from Samaria up in the north, they, they came down and they said, let us help you. We will rebuild this together because, after all, you know, your God is our God. Well, that wasn't exactly so. They had built some kind of quasi-blended pagan Jewish thing. And so they said, no thanks. Well, this is our temple. This is our city. No thank you. Well, they took great offense at that. And uh, they sent word uh, back do you know these people who are a rebellious people are rebuilding the city? Now Cyrus is gone and a new king is there. And uh, so he gets word of this. Oh, the Jewish people are in the midst of rebuilding? Well, tell them to stop. And they stopped. And it lay dormant for many years, like 12, 14 years. It just lay dormant. And then onto the scene comes Haggai and Zechariah. Now, it would help us, I think, to put a little context to this by not starting so much in Zechariah, but in Ezra, because it's a contemporary, and uh, we hear the story from that perspective, and it really is interesting. So turn in your Bibles to Ezra, and we'll come back to Zechariah. Ezra Chapter 5 puts us in the same context of these books that we're studying. Ezra 5, verse 1. Now, when the prophets Haggai and the prophet Zechariah, the son of Edo, prophesied to the Jews who were in Judah and Jerusalem in the name of the God of Israel who was over them, then Zerubbabel, that was the, the governor, he is one of the descendants of David, by the way. Then Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, and Yeshua, who is the high priest, the son of uh, Yozadak, arose and began to rebuild the house of God, to rebuild it after it had been sitting dormant all those times, which is in Jerusalem, and the prophets of God were with them, supporting them. And then they get challenged. <clears throat> they get challenged, and this says that this... Tatnai, governor of the prophets beyond the river, he rises up against them. He sends a letter to now Darius, who's now the king, another king, and he sends a, a letter to them. Are you aware that these people are starting again to rebuild? Now search the archives and see if they've been authorized to do this. Actually, he does search the archives, and we pick it up in chapter 6. We're just building a little context. It's important. Chapter 6. Then King Darius issued a decree, and a search was made in the archives whether, where the treasures were stored in Babylon. And in Ekbaton, in the fortress, which is in the province of Media, a scroll was found, and there was written on it as follows. Memorandum. Kind of interesting the way they did it. In those days, a secretary would essentially stand by the king's uh, throne and just take notes. Whatever the king said, he took notes, and it was in the archives. And uh, so, memorandum, it was in there. Verse 3, in the first year of King Cyrus, Cyrus the king issued a decree concerning the house of God at Jerusalem. Let the temple, the place where sacrifices are offered, be rebuilt, and let its foundations be retained, its height being 60 cubits, its width 60 cubits, three layers of huge stones, one layer of timbers. Let the cost be paid from the royal treasury. That's interesting. Also, let the gold and silver utensils of the temple of God, which Nebuchadnezzar took from the temple in Jerusalem, and he brought to Babylon, let them be returned and brought to their places in the temple in Jerusalem, and you shall put them in the house of God. Now, therefore, 
uh, this is Darius picking up the story. Now therefore, Tatanai, governor of the province beyond the river, Shetherboz and I and your colleagues, the officials of the provinces beyond the river, you keep away from there. You leave this work on the house of God alone. Let the governor of the Jews and the elders of the Jews rebuild the house of God on its site. Moreover, I issue a decree concerning what you are to do for these elders of Judah in the rebuilding of this house of God. The full cost... Get this. The full cost is to be paid to this people from the royal treasury out of the taxes of you people. I just love that part right there. And this is to be without delay. And whatever is needed, both young bulls, rams, lambs, for a burnt offering to the God of heaven, wheat, salt, wine, anointing oil, as the priests in Jerusalem request, it is to be given to them without uh, daily, excuse me, without fail that they may offer acceptable sacrifices to the God of heaven and pray for the life of the king and his sons. I issue a decree that any man who violates his edict, that a timber shall be drawn out of his own house, and he shall be impaled on it, and his house shall be made a refuse heap on account of this. And may the God who has caused his name to dwell there overthrow any king or people who attempts to change this so as to destroy the house of God in Jerusalem. I, Darius, have issued this decree. Let it be carried out with all diligence. That's pretty awesome. Thought you'd like a little background to it. Now go to Zechariah because he picks it up to encourage them to have the faith to rebuild. So we, I kind of started with the end. But now I want to look at the process. Why is rebuilding the temple so important? Well, because the temple represented the presence of God. Therefore, it had a tremendous significance to their faith. So in essence, not only are they to rebuild the temple, they are to rebuild their faith. See, this is really important. I, I take this part very much to heart because there's an application, I'm convinced, to our lives. We are the temple of the Holy Spirit. The temple of the living God is now here, in this place, in this very room. We are the temple of the Holy Spirit. And He is desiring that we arise and build the temple, but let's say, understand, to build faith. That's what God wants us to do. He's rebuilding their faith. That's why Zechariah is, is doing. He's arising and stirring them up. Build up your faith, people. And he's going to give them some amazing promises, some amazing revelation, amazing prophecies. In fact, there's more prophecy about Messiah, Jesus Christ, in the book of Zechariah than any of the minor prophets and many of the other books of the Old Testament. I mean, it is one of the most messianic of all the books of the Old Testament and is absolutely marvelous, so specific in its application. Jesus fulfilled many of those, but it's interesting, as we're going to see, that there are those prophecies yet to be fulfilled because they are fulfilled when Jesus returns the second time and sets foot on the Mount of Olives and then takes his place as King of Kings and Lord of Lords and will rule over the nations of the world. Jesus mentions this in Matthew 24 and 25. We spoke of it uh, in, in Daniel. We looked at it in, in Ezekiel and Isaiah and on through the minor prophets. There's so many places that speak to it. But Zechariah is the most straight up forward encouraging to them. Why is he giving them all of these prophecies? To strengthen their faith. To rebuild their hope. And see, this is what we need to do. We need to build our faith. God's doing that. Faith comes, where does faith come from? Faith comes from hearing, and hearing by the word of God, word of Christ. So when we're going through God's word, and we're getting to know God's heart, faith is being built, and that's what God has called me to do. That's what we're going to do. When we're going through God's word, we're going to build faith, and I'm convinced that's what God wants to do in this church and in this place. Whoever God brings in these doors, we're going to build their faith. God, whoever you send, we're going to build their faith because we're going to teach the Word of God and we're going to believe that God's going to send forth His Word by the power of His Holy Spirit and it's going to transform lives because it's not just about hearing. It's about being and it's about living. 
And therefore, when our faith is built, it translates into a changed life. Because that's what God wants. And so that's what we're going to understand as we go through it. All right, Zechariah 1.1. 1, 1. In the eighth month of the second year of Darius, the word of the Lord came to Zechariah the prophet, the son of Berechiah, the son of Edo, saying this. Now, by the way, the name is Zechariah. It's a fairly common uh, name in the Old Testament, and it means Yahweh remembers. Good name. Names have important application. And this is what the Lord said through the prophet Zechariah. The Lord was very angry with your fathers. Therefore, say to them this. Thus says the Lord of hosts, return to me, return to me declares the Lord of hosts, that I may return to you, says the Lord of hosts. Come now, return to me. And, and, and you know, he's like, I'm holding out all my hands to, a, to a, a opposite and difficult people. I'm saying, come, return to me, come to me. Let's draw near to one another again. It's a call for revival, isn't it? Isn't that what, what revival is? Draw near to the Lord. Draw near to the Lord. How close are you to the Lord? This is a good question for us personally to ask. Is it important? See, many people, they have this thing in their their, uh, mind that, you know, I'll I'll throw God a, you know, a song now and then. I'll I'll, I'll give God a little recognition. I'll give him a nod. I'll kind of wink at him once in a while. I'll kind of wave from a distance. Still love you, God. But he says, no, I I want more than that. Don't just wave at me from a distance. I want you to draw near. The picture is Adam and God walking together in the cool of the evening. I want to walk with you. I want to have relationship with you. You know why? You know why? Because I love you. I made you. The breath that's in your lungs, I breathed it in. You know the life that you live, that life that you have? That came from me. I gave you that life, gave you that breath. You know that strength and that power and that health that you have? I gave that to you. Come, let's walk together. Come return to me. Let's restore, let's renew. So then verse 4, don't be like your fathers. Come, don't be like your fathers. To whom the former prophets proclaim, saying, thus says the Lord of hosts, return now. Return now from your evil ways and from your evil deeds. They wouldn't listen. They didn't give heed to me, declares the Lord. Your fathers, where are they? And the prophets, do they live forever? No, they're gone. But my word stands. My word stands forever. And I'm calling you. Now is your time. See, now is your time. Don't be like your fathers. Your fathers are gone. Don't be like your fathers. Now is your time. Now you stand up. You be different. Now, see, I love this. I really love this because many people are very bogged down in their life because of what their fathers did to them. Oh, I know that one. I could write a book on that one. But see, we don't have to be like our fathers. Whatever your father was doesn't mean that's how you have to be. Let's break this. That's, a, that's one of the things that, that I really felt the Lord speaking to me very early on in my life. This has got to end. See, I looked at my dad. I saw the, the mess that he had made. And I began to have an insight. That's because he's the son of his father. That's because he's the son of his father. And his father was a mess. Where is where's this going to end? Where is this going to end? Am I going to end up like that, like I saw so many of my cousins and such? It's going to end. It's going to end right here. God, I don't want to be like my father. I want to be like you. You're my father. I want to be like you. This is my time. This is my day. This is my life. And I'm going to live it this way. I'm going to honor you with that life. Amen. This is your day. This is your day. This is your generation. This is your life. No more living like your father. Now is your day to live unto your heavenly father. Break the mold. 
Decide now. Choose who you will serve. He says in verse 4, he's challenging them. This is your day. Don't be like your fathers. But verse 6, but did not my words and my statutes, which I commanded my servants, the prophets, did they not overtake your fathers? Then they repented and said, as the Lord of hosts purposed to do to us in accordance with our ways and our deeds, so he's dealt with us. On the 24th day, now uh, we're going to get into a vision. Zechariah has several very interesting visions. And they have interesting insight and application. So the first one. On the 24th day, the 11th month, which is the month Shabbat, in the second year of Darius, the word of the Lord came to Zechariah the prophet, the son of Berechiah, the son of Edo, as follows. I saw at night, and behold, a man was riding a red horse, and he was standing among the myrtle trees, which were in the ravine, with red sorrel, which is a speckled horse, and white horses behind him. And I said, my Lord, what are these? And the angel who was speaking with me said, I will show you what these are. And the man who was standing among the myrtle trees, by the way, a myrtle tree in the scripture represents blessing. It's a blessings. Um, there's a scripture in Isaiah that says, in, instead of the briar, the myrtle tree will come up. When they had the Feast of Tabernacles, um, you know, where they would have a little camp out, the whole Feast of Tabernacles was a great family event. That's where they would take uh, um, some branches and uh, uh, leaves and such, and then make a little, uh, like a little tent out of it, you know, a little lean-to tent, and they'd all camp out there overnight, and it was to kind of emulate or, or replicate the time, the journey that Israel was in the desert, those 40 years living out, you know, in the desert. And so they would have this Feast of Tabernacles and remember the great provision of God, and, and the family loved it. What kid wouldn't love to go camping? And so it's a lot of fun, and they would use myrtle. And myrtle trees, uh, if, if things are bad, they're just bushes, but they can get into nice big, you know, branches. So it's a picture of blessing. But he said, there were these four horses. What are these? With riders is the assumption. I'll show you what these are. Verse 10, and the man who was standing among the myrtle trees answered and said, these are those whom the Lord has sent to patrol the earth. So they answered the angel of the Lord who was standing among the myrtle trees and said, We've patrolled the earth, and behold, the earth is peaceful and quiet. Then the angel of the Lord answered and said, Lord of hosts, he's interceding, he's crying out, O oh Lord of hosts, how long? How long will you have no compassion for Jerusalem and the cities of Judah with which you have been indignant these 70 years? And the Lord answered the angel who was speaking with me with gracious words, with comforting words. I love that right there. The Lord speaks with gracious words, with comforting words. By the way, with what kind of words does God speak to us today? This is important because a lot of people are confused on this point. A lot of people think God's always mad at them. And God's all like that cranky dad that's always upset. You did it again? You broke it again? What's wrong with you? Why didn't you hear me the first time? Well, you broke it again? What's wrong with you? It's kind of like they think that he's a cranky dad. He's always upset with them. Because you know what? Because you know what? You're always doing something wrong. Isn't that not true? I mean, a holy God... He's, got, he's always got something. He's got something to get you with. He, he's holy, and we're pretty much not. Isn't that true? So is our dad cranky? See, this is important. I love you with an everlasting love. I love you as a father who has compassion on his children. My love for you never fails. If you'd only understand how much I love you, I have demonstrated that love. How much have I loved you? I sent my own son to pay the penalty for every one of those sins. That you might be cleansed and be in a beautiful relationship to me if you'd only understand how much I love you. 
He spoke with gracious words, with comforting words. So the angel who was speaking with me said to me, Proclaim, saying this, Thus says the Lord of hosts, I am exceedingly jealous for Jerusalem and Zion. Which means what? This is not negative jealousy like we think of. Jealousy is based on fear and insecurity. No. Greatness of my love means my love is poured out for you. I'm jealous for Jerusalem and Zion, but I'm angry with the nations who are at ease. Oh, the world's at ease. But they shouldn't be because my people are not home. My people are not home. And they shouldn't be because my people are not home. And you see he's like rising up in indignation. My people are not home. Oh, you're at ease. You better take note of this. For while I was only a little angry, they furthered their disaster. I used the nations to discipline my people. They took it to extremes. Therefore, thus says the Lord, I will return to Jerusalem with compassion, and my house will be built there. I will build my house, declares the Lord of hosts, and a measuring line will be stretched over Jerusalem. What does a measuring line over Jerusalem mean? Construction. When you have a measuring line, you start measuring lots and you start measuring the properties because you're going to add on, you're going to do some construction. Measuring line will be stretched over Jerusalem, verse 17. Again proclaim, saying this, Thus says the Lord of hosts, My cities will again overflow with prosperity. And the Lord will again comfort Zion and again choose Jerusalem. Now that's interesting. My cities will again overflow with prosperity. Now this, was, this is to encourage their faith. Because remember, Zechariah is speaking to a people that are discouraged. Place in rubble. 50,000, we're, we're a weakest nation of all the nations around us. The cities are ruins. And you're telling me that, that there's going to be overflowing prosperity? Wow. Now, if you'd believe that, your faith would arise. And the Lord will again comfort Zion, and he will again choose Jerusalem. Then I lifted up my eyes and looked, and here's another vision. There were four horns. So I said to the angel who was speaking with me, what are these? And he said, these are the horns which have scattered Judah, Israel, and Jerusalem. Horns are always a picture of the power and authority of a nation. And so you, in Revelation and Daniel, there's a lot of prophecies about horns, and etc. And they're always having to do with power and authority. You know, in fact, we have, a, we have an expression in uh, our modern uh, language. Uh, mess with a bull, you get the horns. Which means what? There's consequences because of the power of that bull is going to be discovered in the horn. And so he's talking about these horns. These four horns are four nations that have, that have caused, caused the people of Israel to be dispersed, you could say. And so he says, then, verse 20, the Lord showed me four craftsmen. And I said, what are these coming to do? And he said, these are the horns which have scattered Judah, so that no man lifts up his head. In other words, that they've humbled my people. But these craftsmen, they've come to terrify them, to throw them down, to throw down the horns of the nations who have lifted up their horns against the land of Judah in order to scatter it. In other words, yeah, mess with the bull, get the horns, until I cut the horns off. That's what the craftsmen are supposed to do. They got the saw, you know, they, they're going to come and they're going to cut those horns off. God is saying, I'm going to take up the case of my people. And I'm going to throw down those nations that have come against my people. And I will take them down. They are bulls with horns. Yeah, well, I'm going to cut their horns off. It, it, you know, it's, it's kind of like, you know, the modern idea of to a bull. Uh, you know, taking his power away. Should I be more specific? When I was a young man, oh, we had farmers around us, and this is a normal part of raising beef. And uh, one of my jobs was 
to take my little Yamaha motorcycle, and uh, the farmer would say, okay, go get that one. And uh, this, I love this job. And I would with my mo little motorcycle, and I'd go cutting out that bull out, out of the group and bring him into the, into the corral. And uh, then they, okay, let's move on. Let's shall we. I mean, I think we made the point here. It's the same idea. He said, that's what I'm going to do to the nations. They're going to cut their horns off. You get the idea. So chapter 2, then I lifted up my eyes and I looked, and behold, there's a man with a measuring line in his hand picking up this vision. So I said, where are you going? And he said to me, I'm going to go measure Jerusalem to see how wide it is and how long it is. And behold, the angel who was speaking with me was going out, and another angel coming out to meet him, and said to him, Run, 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 speak to that young man, that's Zechariah, and say, Jerusalem will be inhabited without walls because of the multitude of men and cattle within it. In other words, it's going to be so vast and so populated and so successful and so prosperous that it's going to overflow the walls. It's going to be so big that walls can't contain it. But he goes on. Because of the multitude of men and cattle within it, verse 5, For I, declares the Lord, will be a wall of fire around her, and I will be the glory in her midst. Well, this is interesting fulfillment because there's never been a time that Israel has ever been so, uh, excuse me, Jerusalem has ever been so vast as to live outside its walls until modern times. And this we get a hint that many of these prophecies are modern in its application. And here, the, the pouring out of the abundance on Jerusalem is now being seen, but will be further seen when God is in the midst of her himself. Jesus will return, and when, before we get to the end of Zechariah, we're going to get specifics, we're going to get details, unquestionable promises that only Jesus is going to fulfill because we're going to see it when we get there. That's later. So he goes on. There will be a wall of fire around it. That should conjure up in our minds a picture of something. Do you remember back in the scriptures when it spoke of the great prophets, Elisha and Elijah. Excuse me, Elijah came first, and then Elisha. And uh, there was this one occasion, interesting story, that reveals the power of God in these promises. And uh, the, the king of Aram was bothering Israel. And uh, he would say to his, 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 uh, his generals, I want to set up my camp at such and such a place, and we'll attack Israel from there. Well, Elisha, prophet of God, warned the king of Israel, don't camp up there. And so he sent up scouts, sure enough, they're there, don't camp there. And uh, so then the king of Aram said, okay, well then let's, so, uh, let's move over there, we'll set up camp over there. And so Eli Elisha sent word, don't camp there. So they sent scouts, sure enough, and this went on and on. And finally, the king of Aram says, all right, would you tell me who among us is for the king of Israel? We have got a spy in our midst, obviously. And uh, one of his men says, no, my lord. It's that prophet. There's a prophet in Israel that tells the king the words you say in your bedroom, which is a little disconcerting. And he said, find him. Find him. Find him and send an army. Go get him. I've had enough of this. Go get that man. So they sent scouts and figured out where he was. He was in the city of Dothan. They sent an army. The, Elisha's assistant woke up in the morning and he, he alerted his master. We are surrounded. The city is surrounded. The enemy has an army completely around the city. And Elisha prayed. He said, oh God, open the eyes. Open the eyes of this man. See, he, he knew. He understood. Man of God, open his eyes into the spiritual realm. He opened his eyes and behold, chariots of fire surrounding the city, protecting, 
guarding, watching over. Open his eyes. Open his eyes. Then the Lord said, oh, excuse me, then Elisha prayed, Oh God, would you close the eyes of this army? In other words, put a, put a, a blanket of stupor over them. And so Elisha went out to them. This is not the place. This is not the city. I will show you the man whom you seek. This is not the place. This is not the city. I will show you that I just I had to do that. I'll show you the man you seek. And so they followed him. Again, a spirit of stupor over them. He, the army followed Elisha right into the capital, Samaria, the capital of northern Israel. And so when the king came, came out and saw the, his enemy, the army, he like, wow, should I kill them, master? Should I kill them, sir? He said to the prophet, absolutely not, you're not going to kill them. Absolutely, you are not going to kill them. Set before them a feast and let them go. Ah, that's really interesting. They set before them a feast. Of course, their eyes were open by this time. They had a feast, a blessing. Go your way. They opened the gates of the city, and they marched right back home to the king of Aram, who decided to not venture into Israel anymore. I just love the story. But back to our regularly scheduled study in Zechariah, here you have this picture. I will surround you with fire. I will be your protection. And you know, you look over history and time, and you see that hand of favor, blessing. I'll be a wall of fire. Ho there, verse 6, flee from the land of the north. Now, this is interesting. Ho there. Ho is a very important Jewish word. It means, listen up, because this is important. Ho. Flee from the land of the north, declares the Lord, for I have dispersed you as the four winds of the heavens. Ho, Zion, escape. You, now get this, you who are living with the daughter of Babylon, come out from there. I already called you and I'm going to say it again. You come out from there. Come to your people. Come back home. And you know, it's interesting because there is, there is a fulfillment of that happening now, starting in the late 1800s. You, you might know in your history that that area called Palestine set, set essentially dormant. It was just uh, desert, swamps, some areas, uh, no, no growth, uh, a few small villages here and there, pretty much desolate. And it just sat there that way for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years. Late 1800s, an interesting thing, just a stirring of people, just a stirring within Jewish people. You feel what I'm feeling? Like there's something in me. I just feel like it's time to go home. And they're living in uh, New York or uh, London, uh, Russia, Poland, Germany, places all over the world. Dispersed, like he says, to the four winds, dispersed. But th they start feeling this. Do you feel like what I'm feeling? I feel like we got to go home. Yeah, I feel that same thing. But what do we do? We don't own it. It's in the hands of the Arabs. What do we do? Interesting and uniquely Jewish solution. Let's buy it. Exactly what they did. Let's buy it on the market. Well, you can buy land in Palestine pretty cheap. Let's just buy some land. Let's buy some hectares and put them together and build a little kibbutz. Let's drain the swamp. Let's buy the swamp. You can get swamps for pretty cheap in those days. And so a little stirring, a little stirring. And they started raising funds. Some wealthy Jews around the world contributed millions. The Rothschild family in London contributed millions of dollars. Uh, Jews in New York and Chicago co uh, committing millions and millions of dollars. They start buying acre, hectares and land. And kibbutzim started to come up. Why? Why all of a sudden? Why after all this time? Why? Significant? Important? 
I think it's important because Scripture is about to be fulfilled. And God is preparing the way. And he's putting it on people's hearts. He's starting to stir them up. He's rebuilding. They start buying it. They start coming back. Waves, waves start to come. 20,000, 30,000 starting to come back, starting to come back. Come back! And it's interesting, he specifically calls out Babylon. But he calls it, O daughter of Babylon. Now that's interesting. Why didn't they just call it Babylon? Babylon was a living city. Why didn't he just say, come out? From Babylon, he said, from the daughter of Babylon. Hmm, how interesting. Turning your Bibles to Revelation 18. Beginning in verse 4. And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people that you may not participate in her sins, and that you may not receive of her plagues. For her sins have piled up as high as heaven, and God has remembered her iniquities. What's the name of Zechariah mean? God remembers. This is interesting. Pay her back, even as she is paid. Give back to her double according to her deeds. In the cup which she's mixed, mixed twice as much for her. To the degree that she glorified herself and lived sensuously. To the same degree, give her torment and mourning. For she says in her heart, I am a queen. I'm not a widow. I'll never see mourning. For this reason, in one day her plagues will come. Pestilence and mourning and famine. One day, hmm. She'll be burned up with fire one day. Hmm. Interesting. For the Lord God who judges her is strong. For the kings of the earth committed acts of immorality and lived sensuously with her. They will weep and lament over her when they see the smoke of her burning. Standing at a distance because of the fear of her torment. Standing at a distance. Yeah, you don't want to get too close to that for some reason. Woe, woe, the great city Babylon, the strong city. Now, there's no city named Babylon. It's a figurative city. It's a figurative city. It represents the, the, the culture of the times. And does it describe the modern day in which we're living? Oh, it's really an interesting description. And how could she be destroyed in one day with fire? Perhaps modern weaponry? Stand at a distance, on and on. He describes all of the, the, the things as she is burned and destroyed in one day. Come out. Come out from her. Look at verse 19. And they threw dust on their heads and were crying out and weeping and mourning, saying, Woe, woe, the great city in which all who had ships at sea became rich by her wealth. For in one hour she was laid waste. Let's go back to Zechariah. So he's saying, come out from Babylon. Now, is there an application to us? Yeah, I think there is. Don't you think that the Lord in a similar way is saying to us, Listen, you've got to decide what city you're going to live in. You've got to decide what city. Now, representing, you're going to live in the city of God. In other words, are you going to live near unto the Lord? Or are you going to live in the world and all the world's sensuality and all this stuff of the world? Because you can make a choice. You get choices today. Choose, Joshua says, whom you will serve. Choose. You've got to choose whom you will serve. Whether the gods from, the, from where we came in or out of Egypt, or the gods in the land that we're now living Or the great Jehovah who placed his name in your midst. Choose. Now, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And he's making that same challenge to us. You get to decide, what city do I live in? And I'm convinced more and more, God is saying to us, how about this? How about living near to me? Why don't you put your house next to my house? How about this? 
Let's have a relationship. In fact, how about this? Open the door of your heart, and I'm going to come in, and we're going to have dinner. We're going to eat together. We're going to have fellowship. We're going to have relationship. Why don't you live near to me? We will be blessed together in our relationship because we will love each other. And I'll fill you, man. I'll bless you. I'll pour favor. Believe me, there's, there's so much coming up. God's just getting started in this book. He's just warming up. Because there's so much amazing revelation of blessing and favor. Why is he giving them so much revelation of favor? Because he's about to strengthen their faith. Rise up. Build this temple. Rise up. Build your faith. And he's giving promises to us because what is he saying to us? Rise up, man. Rise up. Build your faith. Where are you going to live? How about you set your house right next to my house? How about this? I'll come over. We'll have dinner. We'll have relationship. Don't live in the sensuality of the world in which we're living. Why didn't the Jews want to come out of that Babylon? Times were good. Are you so comfortable? Are you so comfortable with the world that you're dead to me? Don't be dead to me. Be dead to that. Be alive to me. Because you know what? I got news for you. Babylon's going to burn. Babylon's going to burn. Come out. He was telling them that because Babylon was destroyed. And he's telling us that because Babylon will be destroyed. I have an idea. Why don't you get off the Titanic now? Because it won't end well. Come, let's walk together. Let's have relationship together. He says, notice what he says. Verse 8, For thus says the Lord of hosts, After glory he has sent me against the nations. After glory. In other words, I'm going to be in your midst. And then he has sent me against the nations which plunder you. For he who touches you touches the apple of his eye. He who blesses Israel will be blessed. He who curses Israel will be cursed. Don't touch Israel. I'm convinced that he means it. I'm convinced that he means it still today. Don't touch Israel. For he who touches Israel touches the apple of his eye. For behold, I will wave my hand over them so that they will be plunder for the slaves. In other words, those that were enslaved will run that thing on its head and they will be the master. Then you will know that the Lord of hosts has sent me. Sing for joy and be glad, O daughter of Zion, for behold, I am coming and I will dwell in your midst. That is amazing. He's telling this to Zerubbabel and Yeshua and a bunch of broken down people in a rubble-filled city. Listen, I'm going to give you a word, and this word is a hope to you. Behold, I am coming. I'm coming. And I'm going to dwell in your midst. Now get this in verse 11. Many nations will join themselves to the Lord in that day. Clearly it's a prophetic day. And they will become my people. Many nations will become my people. That is interesting. We've studied this before. What's interesting is when Jesus sets foot in Jerusalem, King of kings, Lord of lords, Lords, settles the matter of, of Armageddon, and he reigns over the nations, they will come and bring tribute and honor and glory. A highway will come from the north. A a highway will come from Egypt. And highways will come as the nations come unto Jerusalem and and join themselves. And then you will know that the Lord of hosts has sent me to you, and the Lord will possess Judah as his portion in the Holy Land. There's only one place in the whole world called the Holy Land. And will again, he will again choose Jerusalem. Be silent, all flesh. Be silent before the Lord, for he is aroused from his holy habitation. I don't know about you, but I love the way he's writing that. Because it's powerful and inspiring to us. And he's just getting started. Because in the next chapter, Yeshua, Joshua, is going to be part of this scene. And we're going to hear one of the most famous verses in all of the Bible. 
One of the most inspiring verses in all of the Bible that inspires our faith is going to be seen next week. What is that verse? What is that promise? Come next week and you'll find out. Lord, thank you for tonight and the hope of our faith being strengthened by your word. And I pray that tonight we would truly understand that you're calling us out of Babylon. It's a representation that we can certainly get. You're inviting us to build our house right next to yours. God, I pray that we would truly understand the promises, the favor, the joy that comes with that, the blessings of God that come with that near relationship. Church tonight, where are you living? Where are you living? Where's your house? What city are you identified with? Choose. He's saying, choose. Where are you going to live? I'm asking because I want you to live near to me. I'll come over. We'll have dinner. We'll eat together. We'll have fellowship. It's going to be beautiful. I'll smile on your house. I'll anoint you with power. I'll walk with you. I'll bless you. Church tonight, do you want that? Would you say to the Lord, God, that's so beautiful. That's so beautiful. That's what I want. That's what I want. Just raise your hand. Say that to the Lord. God, that is so beautiful. That's what I want. That's what I want. God, you touched my heart. You've won me. That's what I want. I want that. God, I want to honor you. I want to dwell near you. I want to honor you. Father, thank you for everyone who's being moved of the Spirit, touched of God. God, we pray that you would just move on our lives, touch Take hold, transform us. God, the Holy Spirit is the reality of God seen in our hearts. But we want the reality of God seen in our hearts. We want to be touched, transformed, drawn near to you. We love you for it all now in Jesus' name. And everyone said, can we give the Lord praise and glory and honor? Amen. Amen. Man, let's worship. Let's all stand to our feet. You know, worship is such an important thing. Because it draws your heart near. It draws your heart near. He inhabits the praises of his people. Man, let's just let our hearts be filled as he enters our worship and captivates us tonight as we draw near to him.